Everybody give it up for Elder Dakota. <laughs> Good, grab a seat. Morning, everybody. Um, the announcements for the day uh, is there is a ladies' night tonight at 3 to 5 in the Fellowship Hall. Women 18 and older invited to attend, and child care is provided. Um, we do have a baptism Sunday, which is really exciting, coming up on the 22nd. Whoop, whoop. If you are excited or curious about baptism, come talk to Shane or any of the elders uh, or the front office, and we would love to talk to you about that. And then our last quick thing is our memory verse. Uh, I do want to encourage everybody to not just let this be something you do on Sunday morning, but truly uh, try to memorize it and print it on your heart. So if you guys could stand and join me in the memory verse. See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. First John. The world does not know us, is that it did not know him. First John 3, 1. All right, well, church, it has been an awesome journey through the book of Mark as we continue on going through such an amazing, what we call the action gospel of the Bible. And I love that it has been uh, an incredible journey of finding out who does God say we are and who is, who is Jesus. And we, we are at this point, this kind of small series between the chapters of 8 and 10 in the book of Mark, that we are discovering that Jesus is getting urgent. He's beginning to walk to the cross. He's headed to his death and what will be his victory over death. But he still has a little bit of time on the journey to Jerusalem with his disciples, and he's starting to get intense and urgent in what he is trying to teach them. He's trying to draw for them this contrast between what it means to live for this earth and what it means to live for the kingdom of heaven, both in this life and into the next. And so we've been going through as Jesus is unpacking this idea that the earthly world and, and what we would live uh, in an earthly realm, what would it look different in a heavenly kingdom? How do we live now that we are members of heaven on this earth? Um, as, we, as we sink into that and as you're thinking about that, I just want to remind you that today uh, we're going to have our family chore Sunday. And our Family Chores Sunday is just where we're going to have, if you, if several of you would volunteer to stick after the service for about a half hour to an hour, we're going to work together uh, to uh, encourage the family by working on different parts of the church. We have our library is transitioning from a library to our missions uh, room. And so we're going to be uh, kind of unpacking this idea that we need to be a church about the world and God's movement in and among the world. And so we encourage you, would you join us in helping transition that library? Um, so how many of you, as we get into this passage for today, how many of you have heard the story of the emperor that has no clothes? You guys heard that story? It's about this king. It was back in the time of the kings, kings and queens, and this king uh, had two swindlers or con men who came and, and convinced him that they had the most amazing of robes for him, but that the only way uh, that you could uh, that uh, you'd be able to see them um, was if you were not intelligent. And so they brought in, and these swindlers, they got the king, and they kind of played with, played with it so that they acted like they put on this new suit, this new uh, robe for him, and they talked about how amazing it looked, but it was, in fact, non-existent. And so the king, um, feeling like, well, well, I must be smart, so that's why I can't see it, he walks around that day in his kingdom completely nude, because he thinks he's wearing a robe that everybody else can see. And everybody else, um, as he walks around, um, everybody else was kind of afraid to mention this idea that he's walking around completely naked. So what did they act like? They acted as if he had clothes on. And so, because they were afraid of the king, yes? They were afraid of what he would say if they pointed out that he was walking around naked. 
And so the king walks around all day, and, and eventually this little kid looks up and he says, Ah, king, you don't have any clothes on. And the king uh, just doesn't respond to the kid and keeps walking around thinking that he has clothes on. See, a lot of us, I think the reason why that's kind of a fun illustration, I did a poor job of reenacting it, but this idea that there's something about us sometimes that we like to think that we have that we don't. That we like to think that we're clothed in what we call goodness. And that we are good people at heart. Have you ever had somebody tell you that? When in fact, the Bible tells us a very different story about who we are and what we have. And so Jesus now is going to begin this, we're going to call it a two-part conversation with a man called the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. And the first part, Jesus is trying tenderly to get this rich young ruler to see something that he does not see about himself. He has fooled himself. Anybody kings and queens at fooling yourself? Have you ever lied to yourself? Have you ever lied to yourself? Have you ever had to have a moment where you got smacked in the face with reality? I think a lot of us, um, especially after that COVID era, you guys remember that that time? And there was now we're kind of in this post-COVID era is what they're calling it, right? And so now there's this idea that I think most of us just want to get back to normal. We just want things to be okay. We want to get back to the status quo, back to normal, don't we? We just want to know that we are okay and that things are okay. Anybody have that strong desire and that strong urge? Well, there's this thing about Scripture is it has a tendency to tell us things are not okay, but it's okay. I'm going to say that again. Scripture has this way of telling us that we're not okay, but it's going to be okay. That it's going to be okay. And because the Scriptures have this way of pointing out truth. Hey, I have a video for you that I think is kind of a modern-day rendition of how this conversation would go down before we read in the book of... Well, let's, let's read the passage first. Let me read the passage first, and we'll go into this video. Mark 10, 17 says, And as he was set, setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He continues, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. Would you pray with me for a minute, and I'll put up this video. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us today to get a full grasp of where we are in comparison to your righteousness and to your perfect goodness. Lord, I pray that you would reveal something about us today that would lead us to dependence on the cross. Lord, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me bring this up. How many of you have heard of the Ministries of Living Waters? guy named Ray Comfort. He's an evangelist. He teaches evangelism. Uh, this, this is a, a brief three or four minute conversation with a young man, and it is so, rings so true to us today, so I just want to share it with you. He would be angry at you. Depending on what you do, God will love you for it either way. <laughs> That's what I believe in. So how are you doing morally? Are as you... long as you stay true to yourself, God will love you. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you know in your heart you're doing it for the right reason, love. You have nothing to worry about in this world whatsoever. It's called faith. Let's see how you're doing. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. How many lies have you told in your life? I've lost count. Okay, what do you call someone who's told lies? A liar. So you've blown that one. Have you ever stolen something, even if, you're, even if it's small? Yeah. What do you call someone who steals? A liar. A thief. If you deny that you lie, steal, cheat, and deceit, you become those things. And that's what you have to understand as a human, is that you can't lose yourself in yourself, because that's the double-edged sword of love. 
it's out there. You just got to find it for yourself in order to truly know what it is. And I just want to push that to everybody. <laughs> That's okay, Mara, you were saying that you found yourself. What are mankind's origins? Where do we come from? Women. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, originally, I don't mean from your mother. I mean, where did, what's, what's the origin of humanity? Authenticity and love. No, the origin, where did we come from? What was in the beginning? Man and woman. <laughs> yeah, but for man and woman. Who created man and woman? A higher power. Uh, who was that? God. <laughs> okay. Why do we exist as human beings? To love. Okay, and where are you, where are you going when you die? Whatever you did here, it depends. <laughs> That's true. Now, third commandment, you should not take God's name in vain. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Okay, would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? Never. Never, because you honor her, but you haven't loved and honored God. You've used his name as a filth word to express disgust, which is called blasphemy. So serious, it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. Appreciate your honesty and your, uh, and your patience with me. Now, Jesus said, if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes, I'm a man. <laughs> Have you had sex before marriage? Yes, I'm a man. So, Mario, I'm not judging you. You judge yourself, but you've told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, There's nothing in your music library. Heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day. If he judges you by the Ten Commandments, I've looked at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? Hell. <laughs> now, does that concern you? Deep down, yeah. And it horrifies me. We've just met. I love you. I care about you. The thought of you going to hell just breaks my heart. Do you know what death actually is, according to the Bible? Ultimate enlightenment. Well, no, it's wages. It says the wages of sin is death. God's given you death as wages for your sin. He's paying you in death. He's given you capital punishment. Like a judge looks at a heinous criminal who's raped three girls and then murdered them, he says, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. And sin is so serious to God, Mario, that he's given you capital punishment. Lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, adulterer at heart. Now tell me, what did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you remember? <clears throat> he came up with the idea that depending on what you do here, you're either good or bad, and that's it. You just got to stick to that and have the faith in that. And then no, you're... that's not what he did. Jesus suffered and died on the cross for the sin of the world. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. Mario, if you're in court and someone pays your fine, a judge can let you go. Did you know that? You can say, Mario, there's a stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious. But someone's paid him. You're free to go. And he can do that, which is legal and right and just. And God loves you so much, he became a human being, suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. That means you don't have to end up in hell. God can legally... Forgive your sins, because he's the lover of your soul. And then Jesus rose from the dead and defeated death. Mario, if you give up the battle and just say, God, I'm a rebel, and you repent and trust in Christ, God will forgive every sin you've ever committed and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Do you believe what I'm saying? Yes. It's the gospel truth. I wouldn't lie to you. Are you ready to repent and trust in Christ? Yes. Can I pray with you? <laughs> sure. Father, I pray for Mario. Thank you we met today. Thank you we met today. I pray today he'll truly repent and trust in Jesus and have his sins forgiven in a second and pass from death to life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have a Bible at home? <clears throat> that video, man, it gets me every time. How amazing is that? But did the good news have to come after a hard truth? A bad news. What did Mario have to realize first? That he was not right with God. Today, the most common answer of, are you, uh, are you a good person? Most people would say yes. Most people today would think that they're a generally good person. And see, Jesus, he has this interaction with this young man that goes, I think it went much like this. And this man runs over and he's looking for affirmation and he, he wants to know that he's in a good place with God and, and Jesus doesn't give him the answer that he wanted. 
He was looking for affirmation. I think many of us, we want to go to the Bible. We want to go to God hearing what we want to hear, don't we? We want to be told that we're good to go instead of hearing that we're not good people in need of a Savior, in need of Jesus. And see, here's the difference between an earthly perspective and a heavenly perspective. There are no good people apart from God. And this harkens back to, if many of you remember in the book of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, God created, uh, he created, it, said, it says, Genesis, let us make man in our image. Let us make them male and female. And at the end of that, God says what about the creation of mankind? It was good. But we know something happened. Something went horrendously wrong. Something went terrible. And Adam and Eve, they took of the knowledge of good and evil and essentially told the God of the universe, God, we don't need you. We will now define for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. You can no longer tell us what is right and what is wrong. And here's where we find ourselves today, wrestling with the God of the universe as mankind, trying to tell him that our way is the right way. Versus his way. That's a, the classic earthly perspective versus a heavenly perspective. And this, this man runs up to Jesus, this rich young ruler, and his question is what? What must I do to be given eternal life? What must I do to be given eternal life? I want you to look at a couple things about this question that reveal the heart of this young man. Number one, what we see is this word inherit. If you look at that word inherit, is there something you can do to inherit something? Typically, an inheritance is what? Comes from what? From family, right? If you're inheriting or you're receiving inheritance, that usually comes from family. That's, that's familial terms, right? And so essentially he's asking, what do I do to become a part of the family of God? What do I do to inherit? But in the, the way that he's asking, he's instead asking, what do I do? You reveal in the question that, that this idea, he's getting this idea wrong, that it's not about what we do, but it's about who we belong to. It's about who we are. And so when we today give ourselves to Christ and we say, I believe and trust in you, Jesus, alone for the forgiveness of my sins, the Bible tells us, as we talked about last week, that we're children of God, that we join Jesus in this idea that we are family. And when you're in a family, do you have to do things to be a family member? No, you're just a family member. You might be a lazy family member if you do nothing, but you still got the same last name, right? So there's a sense that even if you do nothing, you're still a part of the family. Well, that's that, that idea of us in salvation. It's not about what you do, but it's about who you know. It's about who you are when you're brought into the family of God. There is no do. There is only be, and that be is to be a son of the Most High God, son or daughter of the Most High God. Helping others will not make you right with God. I need you all to understand this, that helping others. I had a conversation a few weeks ago with a man, uh, and he was saying, you know, I'm a good person because I help, my, uh, help other people in my life. And I said, you know, really, scripturally, no matter how much you help other people, that doesn't outdo the crime of sin in your life. Helping others will not make you right with God. Christians, we help others because we've been made right with God, right? That's why we do good things, not to earn the approval of our God the Father, but because we already have it. Therefore, we do because it has been done to us. We, so staying devoted to a family will not make you right with God. That's another thing that I've heard is, is generally I stay devoted to my family. I, I do the best by them. Many working men would have this philosophy that I provided, that I went to work and I made sure that my kids had something to eat. That makes me a good person. How many of you have heard that? How many of you have believed that? That was my dad for a number of years. He believed that if he just did that, that he was a good person, therefore he was made right with God and could look forward to heaven someday. What you do will never change who you are. Only the king can add you as a son and change your status. 
It's not by works so that no one should boast. And so we know that there are no good people. And Jesus then responds to this man by saying, why do you call me a good teacher? And here he's unpacking that there are none who are good but God alone. I think it's interesting because he's saying, teacher, you're good, and Jesus is good, isn't he? But why does Jesus reflect back that, um, what what he called him a good teacher for? Because this man clearly didn't view Jesus as God, just as a good teacher, number one. So he's, he doesn't believe that Jesus is God at this point. But Jesus is trying to get him to see and accept this fact, this very important truth about the gospel, that no one but God is good. No one but God is good. And God is the highest good. He is the standard of good for us. He's perfect in every way. Now, for us, uh, an interesting book by A.W. Tozer, he talked about this idea that there is no higher good than God. But a lot of us, when we begin to explore our relationship with God, we want to hold God to our standards of good. Have you ever had these conversations with God? It looks a lot like, God, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you heal this person? Why didn't you heal me? Why didn't you save me from this uh, suffering? A lot of us uh, hold God to a higher standard of good that doesn't exist. And so A.W. Tozer points out that there is no higher morality than God himself. He is good. He's the very definition of good for us. When God made humans in his image, he called us good. So why does Jesus then say that no one is good? And we talked about that. That happens at the fall. I want you to hear Romans 5, 12 through 13 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, who was that one man? Adam. And death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And by the way, that's a... that. Uh, makes it to where we can't just blame Adam. How many of you have ever had that thought? Well, Adam's the one who took the apple. I didn't eat that apple. It's his fault. You ever had that conversation? It says there, spread to all men because all men did what? Continued in sin. We continued in what was given to us uh, by Adam. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. That's going to be really important for us. So God, for us, we need to view God as the highest good, the highest good. And this man, he comes to Jesus and he expects affirmation. And instead, Jesus is about to tenderly correct him. How many of you go into conversations thinking you're already right? If statistics are anything, it's like this is the root problem of marriage, one of the highest arguments. Both parties are right, and nobody's wrong. Am I right? I know with your siblings, right? You're right, and the rest of your siblings are wrong. And so we go into conversations, we walk into life thinking that we're going to be affirmed in our way of doing things. How many, as we go into Thanksgiving, as we go into Christmas, you're bracing for those conversations with family members because you already know what you're going to tell them. I see some people laughing at that. It's because I'm hitting on something, huh? And so we go in expecting for our way to be affirmed, but instead God is going to correct this man just like he needs to correct our hearts continually. Every day we wake up, our presupposition is going to be to assume that we need to be affirmed in what we're doing instead of corrected into the right and wrong of God. Because you and I, we swim in a fishbowl of sin. It's really easy to look around and say, hey, I'm better than that guy, isn't it? You can watch movies and you say, hey, I'm better than uh, Johnny Depp. I don't know. I'm just pulling random names out, right? I can say I'm easily better than that fella, right? And so there's this sense that we want to be affirmed. And so we look for ways to affirm ourselves by tearing humanity down. But that's not the standard for which we're judged in order to go to heaven. What is the standard? It's not Johnny Depp, thank goodness. 
It's God, perfection. It's perfection. And all of us is what the Bible says falls short. And so the Bible is constantly going to be in this position of not affirming us in sin, but instead correcting us to a trajectory towards heaven. Okay? Are you ready every time you pick up that Bible to be corrected? Or are you looking for affirmation every time you pick that thing up? God doesn't affirm the sin in our life, but all of us love to be told that we're correct because we are capable of infinite self-deception. Many of you have heard me say this before, that Jeremiah tells us that the heart of man is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who could know its depths, right? And so there's this sense that nobody has lied to you as much as you lie to you as much as you lie to you. And so here is this man, and he's coming. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus starts to unravel, starts to correct, and tenderly show him the truth. Because Jesus is in the business of the truth and reconciliation because he loves us. Have you ever had to be the bearer of bad news to somebody because you loved them and they were doing something harmful? but they couldn't see that about themselves? It reminds me a little bit of that emperor walking around with no clothes. It also reminds me of my kids who sometimes walk around after eating dessert and just have it all over their faces. And it's like they don't notice it at all. And I'm like, you need to go and wash your face. right? Because they, they enjoyed it. They forgot it was there, this idea that there was something going on that they couldn't see. They needed somebody to win. We need, can I, can I just say this? We need God to look into our lives to pick up the carpet and to deal with the dirt. How many of you are willing to go there with God? Or do you love to kind of sit at the passage that says, for God so loved the world? Be like, yeah, that's me. But you don't like to go into that passage, the passages that start to know you and unpack this idea. And so here, this is what leads Jesus to what we call the moral code, the moral test, the Ten Commandments, um, or the 600 and some commandments of the Old Testament stand there to show us, to reveal to us how deceitful our hearts truly are. The latter part of that verse in Jeremiah 17, verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Have you ever avoided a hard truth at all cost? I'll never forget watching as a junior high pastor uh, watching junior high boys try to uh, do this thing called dating in relationships. And it was so funny, like, the the girls would clearly be like, hey, it's time to break up with this kid because, one, he's a junior high boy. But the boy would do everything he could to avoid hearing that conversation. So you'd hear the, the, the boys, the gals would be like, it's time to talk. And you know what the boys would do? They'd just run away. Right? They would find somewhere else to go because they didn't want to hear the news. They didn't want to have the conversation. Anybody there where it's like, you hate those words, it's time to talk. And you run away because you don't like to hear hard things. But Jesus here tenderly uses the law to reveal the heart of this man. It reminds me of a passage in the Old Testament. If you remember David, what was David's major sin in his entire career? Do you remember? It was kind of major, right? He had a relationship with Bathsheba and killed her husband. So he's guilty of murder. He's guilty of adultery. And Nathan, the prophet at the time, had to go this huge roundabout method of sharing this story to get David to recognize his sin. This, This passage where Jesus is trying to get this man to recognize his sin is a lot like that passage. We must allow God to point out on us what we don't see ourselves. Are you guys ready to do some hard work with God this morning? Matthew 5, 21. Let's do some hard work in the Lord. Let's, let's take the moral test. That's a tender way of revealing hard truth in us. 
Matthew 5, 21 through 22. See, the thing about Jesus is he only ever took the Old Testament laws and elevated them. He only ever took them. He didn't lessen them. He didn't make them easier to meet. Instead, he, he made them harder to achieve. And we see that. Matthew 5, 21 through 22 says, You have heard that it was, uh, that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. If we were to pause right there, you would say, hey, I'm not a murderer. I'm a pretty good guy. Yes? Anybody like, sweet, mission accomplished. I didn't murder anybody on my way here. But verse 22 says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus elevates that to the point of hate. Now, how many of you have ever hated somebody? Uh, I think many of us would be guilty of that one. I, I see little hands like, <laughs> thanks for being honest. There's this idea. Yeah, so many of us, I think, are guilty. The, he continues, adultery, lust. Let's talk about that. In verse 27 of Matthew 5 says, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Ladies, you can vice versa this for you and say, if you've looked upon a man with lustful intent, Jesus didn't make God's law easier. He only ever raised the bar for God's holiness. So how many of us would be guilty of adultery? falsifying, lying. There's a couple other ones that he goes through as the Ten Commandments. I lumped them in verse 33 through 37. Matthew 5 talks about let your word be yes and no, that idea of lying. Anybody ever told a, a white lie? A small lie. A small lie. And I like how Ray Comfort says, so what does that make you? It makes you a liar. So by our own admission, we come before and we, as we start to take the test, we realize we've hated, so we're murderers. We've lusted, so we're adulterers. We've lied, so we are liars. You can continue on down this list. See, Jesus in uh, verse 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. And so here's where Ray Comfort, when he's talking to this young man, he says, by your own admission, are you good by God's standard? Are you good by God's standard? And then he follows up that question with heaven or hell. Is this an intense conversation? Have you ever had to sit down with somebody? And, and what if they, can you imagine? I was a, a youth at a youth camp one time, and I'll never forget this conversation with the camp pastor because it ended in me running away from camp. Camp pastor pulled me aside and he said, Shane, I think you're going to hell. Because I, I was a hell raiser, if you will, at camp. He said, Shane, I think you're going to hell. And I was like, cool, peace, I'm out. And I left, right? Because I don't like being confronted, but I love the way that, that both Ray Comfort and Jesus here just confront this guy. And he says, by your own admission. Here's the goal for us. Did you see that? Uh, Mario, did you see his face begin to change? He went from confidently thinking that he was a good person to realizing that before God's holy standard, he was condemned. And when he had to finally admit hell, by that standard, I go to hell. Brothers and sisters, how many of us needed that reminder that at one point we were on the verge of an eternity in hell, separated from God. But there's this idea of contrition. So the law points out in us that we are not good. We are not good, but that is a good thing. 
for us to understand because if we remain ignorant and continue to lie to ourselves, that means that we will never reach out for the grace of God. Amen? And so there's this idea that the the bad news has to precede the good news. But yet we have become a people, a Christian church, that likes to avoid the bad news because that's uncomfortable. And we have a generation of people growing up with a message that says they're good people. And what does that essentially do? It robs us from being able to lay hold of the full grace of God. Because we are in we are we are capable of infinite deception. I want you to think about the words that this young man said to Jesus in response. He said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. You got to imagine that Jesus was like, hmm, really? Really? In the conversation that's about to happen, Jesus is going to unravel it very personally for him. We're going to talk about that next week. But just like this phrase, brothers and sisters, you and I have to continually fight to make sure that we don't deceive ourselves and we don't deceive others, that our message is not that we're good people, be like us. There was a season in Christianity where we were the moral majority in the U.S., and and that's where we looked around at the world and we said, you need to be more like us, but not in the way that the Bible teaches. Instead, we were trying to say, you need to be good like us. What if we became a people who admitted readily that we're not good? Say this with me, ready? Christians are not good. Ooh, did that just sound awful? Did that, like, had a hard time coming off your tongue, right? But the reason that we can say that is that now you can turn to a world that that knows sin and can say, hey, I'm saved, not because of what I have done, but because of who God has made me through faith. And you can have that too. We get to be people who are exemplifying God's grace. We are not good people. We are people in desperate need of Jesus. There's nothing holy about me, and just because I'm a pastor, there's nothing good about me. I am not good. I am in need of Jesus. And that's what unites us together as a church, is our need, our desperation for Christ when you consider yourself a good person and get to uh, and get to think about you you relax the law and steal its purpose when you begin to think of yourself as a good person when you tell other people i can't tell you how many times i've heard a christian counsel somebody else you're a good person how many times have you told your kids that oh you're a good person at heart Brothers and sisters, what if we let those be teachable situations like, hey, that's good by human standards, but by God's standards, we are in desperate need of Jesus, and so are you. I tell that to my kids all the time. You're a bunch of little sinners in need of God's grace, just like daddy, just like daddy. The purpose of the law is to gently teach us that we are in hot water. Do you guys ever see those signs, the Thermopolis signs, when you're driving? They say you're in hot water. One time Becky and I were driving, and I just looked up and I read that. You're in hot water. And Becky looked at me like, I'm in trouble? Like, what What did I do? Like, she thought we were going to get into a fight. And it was like, no, I'm just reading the Thermopolis sign. But there's that kind of idea of hot water, just like a lobster. If you've ever cooked a lobster or if you've done the experiments where you just slowly raise the temperature of the heat of water for like a frog or anything, what happens to those the lobster or the frog? It boils alive, doesn't it? It boils alive, but it doesn't ever jump out. It doesn't get out. So there's this idea that we've become really cozy in this culture, thinking that we are good, and all the while on our way, and there's a whole world on its way to eternal death. It robs penitence. And I want you to think about this. So it relaxes the law, and penitence is a part of repentance. Did you see Mario, his face, as he began to realize that he was not right with God? What happened there? Real conviction. Repentance. It really changed who he was, and he began to weep over his standing before God. And that's a beautiful first step in coming to Christ. Many of us, when we share the gospel today, we share a partial gospel. We say that Jesus loves you, 
And that's true. Jesus loves us, yes. And we say that Jesus paid the price. And when I begin to talk about the cross, people kind of start to yawn, <sighs> get tired, like, oh, I've heard this message before. And I'm like, you clearly, if this is boring to you, if the cross is boring to you, what's missing? Brokenness for your sin. Because he who has been forgiven of a lot loves a lot, according to Scripture, right? And so in your mind, if the cross is not astound you every time you think about it, maybe it's because you're starting to fall into this little lie that this culture has, has planted in us, that you're a good person, and that Jesus really kind of died for nothing. You didn't really need him because you were a good person. It robs us of a true depth of appreciation of our God. Our job is not to make people feel better about themselves. I need you to hear that, Christians. We're, our job is not to make people feel better about themselves, but to point out the reality that they might be desperate for, de for salvation. Bad news before you can appropriate, uh, appreciate the good news. I had a conversation with a young college guy a couple of weeks ago. He pulled me aside. He said, Shane, you kind of made me feel bad about myself. And I didn't really like that. And I looked at him and I said, good. And he frowned at me. He was like, you're a jerk. I said, because I hope that that leads you gently and tenderly into the arms of God's grace. Because you're not good to go. And this was a guy who'd been Christian for a, long, a number of years. See, salvation requires on, honesty and authenticity. My generation really loves authenticity. Not really. Because when you're really authentic with the idea that you're a sinner, we avoid it at all cost. But we love the idea of authenticity. Our ability to convince ourselves that we are good is the most damaging thing to our walk with God and the gospel going out to a lost world. Many today were just uh, told to ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus loves you, but they were never told the truth. How many of you, that's how you came to faith? That you were, you were told, ask Jesus into your heart. What about asking Jesus into your heart leads you to repentance? Did you know that phraseology is not actually in Scripture? Nowhere in the Bible does it say, ask Jesus into your heart. But it says what? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's why I believe that there are a number of people in the church today that are not saved. They don't truly know because they've never regretted their sin. They just wanted God to support them in it. Many today were just told to ask Jesus in your heart. The gravity of God's grace, it hits different when you realize the depth of your sin. I want you to think about, and I want to leave you today with this picture that started the great, uh, the great awakening in the U.S. in the 18th century. Any of, any of you ever heard this sermon or read about the sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God? You guys ever heard of this? It was by a pastor in the 18th century. It was his, his title. How many of you would love to come to this sermon? The title was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Let me give you an excerpt of this sermon and tell me if I preached it, would you guys like run? It says, here's just a little excerpt. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. Anybody feel encouraged? But as Jonathan Edwards preached this sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you know what happened? God began to convict. People began to weep. And just like what you saw with Mario, they began to realize that they were not right with God. And you know what happened? The first great awakening in the U.S. 
when people walk in repentance and stop saying they're good and start saying they need Jesus, look out at what happens to the gospel. I want to follow up with uh, to Jonathan Edwards' sermon with this. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 says, But God, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ so that in the coming ages we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. <laughs> After Jonathan Edwards' sermon, that hits differently, doesn't it? When you hear the grace of God and you think, oh, I was abhorred by God, but now I'm a son of God, you go, wow. But... God. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And so when we compare ourselves to the world, brothers and sisters, we lose an appreciation for the gospel and for the cross. And Jesus tenderly tries to remind us by using the Ten Commandments here, as he does with this rich young ruler. So what? Would you be instead of do? Would you be with God? Would you be a son or a daughter adopted by him instead of trying to do things for your salvation? Would you stop lying to yourself? And would you rejoice in the mercies of God? If you're a small group leader, would you carry this question with you? Why is it important to admit you are not good? Why is it important to admit that you are not good? I'm going to go ahead and have Jennifer come up, and we're going to just have a time of response and giving. She's going to play a little bit, but would you maybe go through that list? Would you remind yourself of where you stand with God, maybe where you stood with God before salvation? And would you stand with me as we pray and close. Lord Jesus, we just pray, God, that you would go to work on our hearts. Lord, would you awaken us up to the things that we don't see about ourselves? God, would you help us to not look for affirmation of our flesh, but God, would you increase in us our holiness? God, would you help us to stop lying to ourselves and to do hard work with you and to go into your word looking for it to penetrate and to divide our fleshly desires and the Spirit's works in us. Lord, we pray that you'd make those distinct in our lives. God, I thank you so much for your precious and good gospel, and I pray that we would be a people inspired by it as we go out from here today. In Jesus' name, amen.